All right, so I'm Professor Beck. I don't know, some of you might know me, some of you not. Uh, other people know me that I don't know at Lyon often. But so I'm going to be your professor for the class World Philosophies for the next four weeks. And I'm excited to have you in class. There are going to be 10 students and that's a good number for online classes. Um, in terms of logistics, I just invited you to two different uh, Google Classrooms. Um, so please accept the second one because I decided I did this class last summer and I'm just gonna use, I'm gonna start with all the same materials and I can easily switch them up. This is not because I'm lazy. <laughs> it's because it took me so, so much time to punch buttons to get that in place. And now I don't have to spend time punching buttons. I can actually spend time thinking, maybe reading something, maybe keeping up with the news, uh, talking to students. Um, so I think it's going to be really good in terms of staying focused on the life of the mind and not having to focus on punching the right button. So um, we, let's see, the logistics of the class. I will prepare a one hour presentation like I'm doing right now. And it should give you a general overview of how, what, why I assigned, what I assigned before, and what you have to look forward to next time. Today, I will also go through the schedule to explain that. Here's why uh, this lecture begins and why it leads to that lecture and all these things. So you get a general overview. Um, then, because I've given you that one hour, I don't really want to say much more than that before the class begins. And so you are expected to have read and come prepared with three questions or topics you want all the students to discuss during the class. So each of you has to have your video on and then I will call on you one at a time. But if another student wants to question the, the student, that's great. So each student presents their comment. Then I ask the other students if they want to ask a question, then we move to the next one. Um, most days, because we're having condensed classes, we will do two rounds of that. Um, but the class will meet from 6.15 to 7.45 on the weekdays. Um, and then you have that additional one hour where I, of uh, video that I send to you. Um, then every Tuesday and Thursday, after class. So you will write a post, right? All I, you have to post it by Wednesday before uh, noon and Friday before noon. So you can write it after class on Tuesday and Thursday or the next Wednesday or Friday morning, just get it posted. You post it on the Google Classroom. I will give you that. Um, it'll, it'll say on the stream, you know, that I have posted another assignment. Then you go and put your post there. Um, those posts have to be, uh, they start out 
you write for every class, you write, here are the questions I brought with me to class. And then here are my reactions. So you have three questions or issues to discuss. You have three reactions to what the other students said. And then you have your final takeaway. What did I really gain from this class? So before the first day of class, you already know that you have an assignment. You're supposed to write an essay about my world view. I did not tell you what is a worldview. You ask yourself, what is a worldview? You have to, you don't have to look it up in the dictionary or anything. Even if you did look it up, you have to figure out where did I get a worldview? When did somebody ever talk to me in a way as if there was a worldview going on somewhere? Um, so you have to connect with the word, not just read in a dictionary the definition. So then each of the students will react to that. And at the end of every class, you, when you're doing your final takeaway for that class, you, your final paper is to write another version of the same paper. What is my worldview? So after every class, you react, my takeaway, will I include this in my final worldview? Do I think I will? And why? Or do I think I will not? Or do I know I will not? And why? So every reading, when you start reading it, you're coming at it with, what do I think about this? Is this going to be part of my worldview from now on, right? Do I think this way? Do I want to think this way? Um, and why? So, so that's how the class should build. Um, so every Tuesday you do it on the classes from Monday and Tuesday. So you'll have to go through that process a couple of times. Here's my, here's my thoughts before the, on the first reading. Here's my responses. Here's my takeaway on that reading. Here's my thoughts for the next one. Now, it's possible that we won't get through two rounds um, in, a, in a class. And then you're not expected to have two sets of reactions if we only had one reading or we only got through one or whatever. All right. So that gets posted and all of those posts together, I think there should be eight of them, is going to count plus your class participation counts for about a third of the grade. Then every weekend you have to write a paper. So every Monday you have a three page paper due, a thousand words or more. Um, and then I have paper topics that I'll, that are posted. Then I have, you have to present your paper and that's a more formal presentation. And the speaking rubric is on the post for the first day of class. So I'll go over that tomorrow during class. And um, I'll grade you on those speaking rubrics on this, your oral presentation and other students ask questions. So every Monday we start with your oral presentations and then we start with the reading for Monday and we do the usual reactions, whatever. And that will be the beginning of your post for Tuesday night. Um, all right, each of those papers that are due on Monday, there's three of them, counts for approximately 15% of the grade. Then the final paper is due, 
the day after the last class, which is August 5th, because my the grades are due August 6th. So I've got to get these papers by August 5th. And um, the final paper will count for approximately 20% of the grade. So um, So that's the technical stuff, or part of the technical stuff. Um, oops, I can, I can actually share my screen here. That should have, oh dear. Right. Okay, I can, I will do this, and do this, and do this. There we go. So here we are. I have the whole last summer's version of the class there, which will make it a lot easier for me to make adjustments. Every class is different. I have no problem with that. Um, so here's the syllabus. The, Oh, my office hours are actually going to be, I changed my office hours. Um, my office hours will be on Thursday, no, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday from 9 p.m. to midnight. Not because I'm teaching in Bangladesh. And those are the office hours I have for my Bangladeshi students because that's 8 a.m. for them. And so if you need office hours at a different time, then you can just contact me and we'll do it by appointment. Um, all right, so here's the catalog description. The texts, I would like you to order three texts. Um, two of them I, I think are out of print, but you can get them inexpensively. Uh, it's not a problem. So this is a very inexpensive class. I did put on the, what, online bookstore, these other books to order. If you ordered them, I'm glad <laughs> they're worth it. They cost a couple dollars. I think they're worth your money. These are some of the best books ever, the books that have lasted forever. And um, basically, publishers beg you to take them off their hands. They cost so little. And the reason they cost so little is because you can't make any money reading these books. <laughs> you can get a life but you can't get any money. So here are the skills that I'm trying to develop in my students. Um, we had, I've spent hours on these objectives, course objectives. So you can read all that over. I did my homework. Um, my goal is to get you to speak your mind, all right? Um, I know students say she just wants our opinions. Well, I'll tell you, some opinions on these subjects are a lot more sophisticated than others. And human history is determined. It's governed by people's ideas about these questions. God justice, injustice, good and evil. So they're not just opinions. They're the drivers behind human history and behind human behavior and behind your life, right? You are driven by some idea of the good. It brought you here to Lyon. It was the reason you did what you needed to do to get into college, to get to Lyon College, whatever it is, but you're dr being driven by some idea of the good or your own best life. 
So you are in the middle of creating your life. Your decision to go to college and which college were two of the major decisions you've made so far in your life. This is just the beginning. You are the creator of your life. And you better get some good ideas about good and evil, the good life, because now it's up to you to make decisions. And if you base those decisions on bad opinions or incomplete opinions or good intentions, but big mistakes, you're going to fail, right? Or your society is going to fail. So I try to educe what is inside of you. I don't tell you what I think, other than I think people need to think critically. People need to have liberally educated minds. But other than that, I don't tell you what's on your mind. You tell me what's on your mind. And that's how you develop your mind. That's how your mind becomes active. And then you also need to communicate it to your other students, to the other students. Um, attendance is important and I have an attendance policy. Um, the nature of the class, okay. And then I explain this. Let's see. And I, again, I've changed my office hours. I, this is when I could meet additionally if you don't, if you can't meet from nine to midnight. But otherwise, I will just combine those office hours. And then um, students present. And then I will do a screen share of the outline I had for the day. And I'll try to wrap up the points that I wanted to make. Um, tardy matters. Don't text. Do not stare at your lap. Okay. Keep your, I would keep your notes up so that, so you don't have to stare at your lap. Put your notes on your desktop. You have to have your video open. You have to be looking alive, like, right? Look like you're paying attention to other people who are talking because we are trying to have a meeting of the minds. We're trying to create a community of discourse, an intellectual community. And democracy depends on citizens who are committed to talking to each other and listening to each other and coming to some sort of agreement on the questions of good and evil, justice and injustice, the relationship between church and state, the nature of religion. These are all extremely important questions. And when students say it's just your opinion, it means that they're not taking the questions seriously when they are the most serious questions. Um, all right, so here's your requirement about the post. Here's your requirement papers, the final paper. This is the punishment for late papers. If you are thinking of minoring or majoring in RPH, you have to keep a portfolio. So make a file with all of your papers and then with three or so of your favorite posts at, so that you'll have that at the end of the class and you can Put all those together in all your RPH classes and then send it to Dr. BV, Dr. Becker, and I will keep these. And then when you are a seniors, we have a senior exit interview and you write a little essay about what you learned from RPH classes. And then we all meet together and have a discussion about that. So it's uh, an enjoyable time. I'm in Minnesota, but I drive back to Arkansas to be with students that last week of class, and that's when we can um, get together. So I'll be there in the room is the plan anyway. Um, 
All right, so participation. Um, actually, I thought I had changed this, but participation is one third of your grade. The three papers are 15 points each and the final paper is 20 points. So, um, all right, then we have the honor code policy, the harassment policy, last day to drop the ninth, drop with a W the 23rd. All right, so that's that. Um, here is uh, something that Lion students tend to come to Lion with some kind of um, idea of faith or flourishing, some idea of the human good. And, and this is one way you could think about where you are on this continuum. Are you just um, disinterested in thinking about what you really care about? Perhaps what you were exposed to up through high school is something that means nothing to you. And so you're detached. Um, so you might be in that sort of state. You know, you're, this is not something you even want to be thinking about. The other position is that you're just going to accept whatever you were raised with. Um, it's not, you've never critically examined your, the religion of your parents or the worldview of your parents. You borrow ideas from other people. You don't think for yourself, right? You just stand by whoever ha you happen to admire without any particular reason for doing so. Then there's the next stage is that you start to critically examine potential alternatives. And so this class gives you a lot of alternatives. And I'm asking you to critically examine yourself by reading this material and asking, um, what do I think of this and why? Do I like this position? Why or not? Why not? So you're moving into this um, critical thinking. And then the last one is that you've come to some sort of conclusion. Well, I don't like, there's a lot of stuff I don't like about this, but if it triggers something inside of you, that's fine. But a path achieved identity, I, I don't think I have an achieved identity, right? I'm always reconsidering things. I think self-examination and asking other people to rethink their assumptions is just what life is about. So when I moved back to Minnesota, I like my mind is very different than it was before I moved here five weeks ago. I really, really think differently, and I'm glad I do. Um, I think about different things. Uh, I wake up in the morning, and my dreams are different. My thoughts are different. Um, I always get up in the morning, and I've my brain has been working, and I have certain ideas, or I remember my dreams, and so it's really different now. So I, this idea that you can, a college student would have an achieved identity is just a bit much to me, but um, they, if all it means is that you know why you think what you do at the moment, um, then, and you're, you know, you you're engaged with the world, um, then, that's that's fine. It just seems like you're moving back to your own position, but you're just going to be foreclosed and a guardian in this new position. And I just don't think that's the way to go. It's you just have to keep your mind active all the time is the way I think about it. I think that's especially true because 
the climate change in your lifetime, it's going to absolutely change your life. By the time you're my age, if you're alive, which you might not be, the weather will have been so, have changed so much that everything about your life is going to be different. And I do not do you a favor by, by making, giving you the impression that I agree with anybody who thinks it's a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of opinion. And it hasn't been a matter of opinion for 70 years. So climate change will completely change your life. So I do think you need to be in a constant um, uh, level of critical thinking so that you don't panic and that so you don't fall for political lies, politicians who are gonna tap into your fears and say all sorts of things that aren't true. Or somebody's got to lead, right? Somebody's got to keep their head on straight. Somebody's got to say, I know this. Everybody who studied it knew. And we're going to, you know, move forward in, in the light of this, with this as part of what we have to tackle. So um, let's see. We have a speaking rubric. So on Mondays, when you give your presentations, this is what I'll be looking for. If you're organized, um, do you present your paper in an organized way? Beginning, middle, and an end? Is your delivery good? Do you look, you know, look at the audience and um, be accessible, present yourself, project? Um, do you know the subject? Do you, do you know what you think? And you also refer to the readings and it's clear that you've read the readings, you know what they say. And then you have a central message or a thesis. So your paper should have a thesis. Your oral presentation should have a thesis. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, the paper rubric. This is um, every paper needs to have a good thesis. And I do not require that you meet with me for a conference about your papers. I recommend it because I think students, when they come with ideas about what they want to write, I can help them. I can give them uh, ideas for where to go and reread, where they might find a quote to support their ideas. I can ask them what their idea means, how they got that idea, how they're going to support it. I can give them suggestions for how else, how they could add to their supporting their idea, or I could question their idea and say, um, I'm not sure, I mean, what about this? Have you thought about that? So make sure you hash that out in your mind and you have a, a thesis that's worthwhile, it makes a difference. Then you have the arguments. The arguments have a premises and a conclusion. So when you're starting out with your premises, are they reasonable? Are they based on either the facts or some uncontroversial assumptions or what the authorities in the field accept? Um, and then you draw a conclusion from your premises. Are the conclusions reasonable? Are they stated clearly? Um, do all of your conclusions fit together? So the way the thesis works, all your arguments have to go back and support your thesis. They can support it individually or together. If you put all the arguments together, together they support your thesis. Um, your textual references, you have to have three references based on either what we've read or something outside of what we've read. If it's what we read, you have to cite it but you can do it in a simple way. You just cite the name of the attachment 
and the, the date of the attachment. Um, and then if it's a reading outside of the class, then you have to have a MLA or an APA. You have to have one of those official citation um, requirements. Okay, uh, and and you okay? So you so when you're formulating your thesis, you have to show me that you read these assignments carefully, and you're referring to those assignments. You have to come up with a paper you couldn't have written before the class began. And I, you know, I can't believe sometimes students will write a paper and I say, you didn't really have to take this class to write this paper. So, so I mean, you know, oftentimes they, they don't think they're cheating, right? They just had this other idea. No. You have to show me that you're using the material of the class to learn something new, to expand your mind. Then you have to have examples. Um, your examples should show the connection between your ideas, your argument, and what it actually means in people's lives. Um, why you think the way you do based on experiences, based on concrete examples. So you describe it, but you don't spend too much time describing it. You don't have too many examples, but you have some examples. And the examples ha have to actually support the point that you're making, right? So this is, this is general, but I mean, it has happened. Um, someone will get all caught up in an example and you lose track of the argument. You don't wanna do that. Someone will refer really indirectly. It's like the time my friend did X and I was like, wait a sec, how did that prove your points? <laughs> you know, you have to show me what is the connection. Um, and then you don't have too many examples. Like the paper is going to be about some idea and why that idea is worthwhile. And so, you do need examples to show why it's worthwhile, but you don't need the whole paper to be examples. Um, the counter argument, what would somebody who disagrees with you say? What's the strongest argument against what you want to claim? And then you have to have the paragraphs. Each paragraph has a topic. You explain the connection with the thesis, right? The paragraphs are linked linked together, the paragraphs are internally organized, the grammar is good. And so up to there, up to that point, technically, that should be a C in the old days. Um, in, in my way of doing things at this point, it's a B minus because great inflation is a terrible problem. But I don't have to give you, I have no obligation to give you higher than a B minus. If you have a decent thesis, arguments, text, examples, counter argument, paragraphs, and grammar, right? Here's what gets you beyond a B minus, that your paper is complex. Your paper is complete. All the all the points uh, are supported. You supported everything you needed to. It's creative. It's original. Um, it, it shows how the, the thesis explains a current trend, right? So it's not just that you found an example for what you wanted to say, but you, you're using what you wanted to say to show a whole trend of things that's going on. Um, and why that's important. And then the RPH program um, supports these characteristics of a liberal mind. This is what my classes, every day in every way, I try to promote these two uh, goals, okay? Um, intellectual honesty. So if you try to tell me that you know God's will or something like that. I say it's not intellectually honest. You're lying to yourself. 
You don't know that. And how are you going to act on the basis of it? Are you going to act on the basis of it in a way that harms another person? Because no God is going to want you to harm another person. So I just think that's intellectually dishonest. And I've heard a lot of it in my life. Um, you're committed to truth. Again, if someone just says it's God's will, it means you're not committed to actually finding out what's going on. You just want to write it off. You don't want to think about it. So there's different understandings of truth, but you have to separate out what is your idea of truth. And, and then you have to be committed to seeking the truth. You have to be fair to opposing points of view. That's why the counter argument is a, an important part of your paper. You have to be patient with complexity and ambiguity. There's so many problems in this world that are extremely serious. They have to be addressed, but they're complex and they're ambiguous. And you have to be patient with that. And you have to keep figuring out how to make distinctions until you get to the point where you have a claim about what you think the next step should be but recognizing that you might be wrong or you might the next step tomorrow is different than the, the next step today it's a constant process of examining and re-examining and you tolerate reasoned dissent people can agree to disagree but they have to have reasons okay and then the last one is that you have an idea of the human good or what it means to flourish, and then your own good, and then the good of maybe your country. You have some idea of flourishing or God, God's will. So you can use God's will, but you have to link reason, faith to reason. So the RPH program is the union of reason and faith. And the Presbyterian tradition is the reasoned faith. And then liberal arts education, Lyon College as an institution is a liberal arts school. One of the main foundations, cornerstone of liberal arts colleges was the union of reason and faith. So our, there's lots of different notions of reason. There's science, there's social science, there's just argumentation, there's inferences, there's deductive, inductive, all sorts of stuff. So there's many varieties of reason and there's many ideas of faith or the human good. But your paper shows some connection, shows connections all the way down basically. Um, so that's, that is the paper topics. That's the criteria that I'm looking for. Um, let's see. This is the first week of class, the assignments for the first week. Um, so today, for next time, we're going to talk about Plato and Athenian democracy. So um, Plato wrote about how Athens had this wonderful democracy and they lost it. And they, the citizens corrupted their freedom, created a whole lot of instability. And eventually they elected a dictator. They chose to give up their democracy. And he's explaining through his dialogues what was going on in Athens. How did we lose our democracy? I think this is very relevant. I can't think of anything much more relevant. But, but I've been teaching this for 40 years, so I guess I get myself tied up in knots. And I sort of look at the world a certain way. But so the very first... Um, after the first day, the second day of class, right away, you read a dialogue where Plato's talking to a religious leader, and he thinks he knows God's will. 
And Socrates is saying, are you sure? Tell me. <laughs> so Euthyphro thinks he's close to God. He's righteous uh, or pious or holy, whatever you, whatever word you use for somebody you think is particularly religious or particularly serious about religious issues. And, um, and then you have to write. So Euthyphro and Socrates have this conversation and you have to write about, do you think Euthyphro was holy? Why or why not? Do you think Socrates was holy? Why or why not? So that's right out, right out, out of the gate, we're gonna do that. And then the next one, the, let's see, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we do Plato's Apology, the character of Socrates. Um, the Western intellectual tradition, Socrates is a major foundation of that tradition. And hopefully you will understand why the Western tradition is associated with a free society, free and open society, not a self-governing, citizens take turns ruling and being ruled. This is what the West has been um, known for. Um, I think it's really being challenged. I think it's your duty. Every single generation has a responsibility to preserve the tradition. And Plato explains how Athens lost it in 30 years. They went from a golden age where they had won a war to electing a dictator in 30 years, okay? So every generation has to pick up the torch and, they, and the most serious question, anybody who has enough of a free and open society to read Plato's dialogues or to have a society that has liberal arts institutions in it, which means institutions that encourage you to think critically about everything, no blind obedience, no blind faith, no blind patriotism, no blind religion, no blind um, loyalty to family or anything. You have to examine everyone and everything in the light of the truth and justice and a natural standard that everyone is accountable to. So um, Socrates is a cornerstone figure in that tradition. So we're gonna talk about Socrates. Um, and then also Socrates got killed for it, right? Athens became anti-democratic. So, and he didn't escape. He had a chance to escape from prison and save his life and he refused. So those are the issues we're gonna talk about. And then um, on Friday, we talk about Aristotle's virtues, which I would call classical humanism. And we compare Jesus and Aristotle and Socrates. And then you have to come up, you have, there's some questions for you to answer. So um, that's what we're doing this week. We're starting with the Greeks. Um, later on, Every single, um, every single lecture, every reading is some sort of used union of reason and faith. So that's what I want you to get comfortable with and to um, be curious about and be engaged with. So before I shut this down, I really do want to tell you that I do not think we, America is a democratic society because I do not think there are enough citizens who are, who are liberally minded. In order to have a democracy, you have to have enough citizens who are respected enough, uh, who have these character traits in order to prevent 
people from being manipulated by power hungry politicians and money hungry um, business leaders, economic leaders who will manipulate them and they don't care. They don't want to think critically. So between the people with power and wealth that are totally corrupt and try to manipulate the populace and the populace that allows itself to be manipulated. I think America is basically not democratic because democracy requires incredible intellectual discipline and moral discipline. You have to be honest. You have to admit you don't know. I don't think enough Americans admit to what they know and don't know. They have to be committed to truth. I don't think enough Americans are committed to a notion of truth that will preserve democracy, which the truth is we're all human beings and we all should treat each other as human beings. We should all follow the golden rule. We should all elect political leaders who create laws to form a strong middle class. We should all want to be middle class. We should all be generous so that nobody, we don't have the rich versus the poor. If someone committed to, to democracy, they don't live a rich lifestyle that's not democratic. If they're underprivileged from the start, they do what they need to do to get into the middle class. So people have to be committed to the truth about how they need to relate to each other in order to preserve democracy. They have to be fair to opposing points of view and not polarized, not demonize the people they disagree with. They have to be patient with complexity and ambiguity. They have to sit down and try to solve problems rather than just um, oversimplifying those problems. And they have to tolerate people who disagree with them, but who have good reasons. Because if you have good reasons and you're basically a reasonable person, reasonable people will agree with each other more than they disagree with each other. And um, you can have a, a free and open society if that's true, but you, you have to have these character traits to have a free and open society. And you have to um, unify reason with faith. And our founding fathers knew that. And that's why they wanted liberal arts schools. So I've been honored to have a career where I work at a liberal arts institution, especially uh, Lyon, because most of my students have come to school with the assumption that reason and faith don't mix. And then I say, if you want a democracy, our founding fathers knew that you had to tie down faith with reason or you're not gonna have democracy. And we do read, there's a reading that I give you, the virtue of an educated citizen, where this is true. You know, I didn't make this up. Um, but I do want you to think about that quite a bit because the more you split reason and faith, you destroy democracy. There's no two ways about it. And our founders understood that. Um, so that's what we're doing. My job as the philosopher at Lyon is to basically over and over again, remind you of the philosophical foundation for Lyon College. Lyon College does not discriminate based on religion or gender or race or sexual orientation, um, ethnicity. Well, you've got to have a certain view of humanity and the human condition in order to think that it's virtuous and it's just not to discriminate because discrimination is based on some kind of a lie. And so your institution is based on 
the truth, your idea of the truth. And that is Lyon's conviction about what's true. So students who take this course at least get educated in the philosophical foundation of the institution, which also is the foundation of the religion and philosophy program. And also, I, my father was a Methodist minister and he united reason and faith because Methodism does that. Um, John Wesley did that. That's foundational in the Methodist church. So it, I didn't, I didn't even consider splitting them at all. But when I started teaching at Lyon, I realized most of my students come to school having split them. So that became my mission at Lyon. Every single lecture I had was another version of how to unite reason and faith. So that's what my classes are about. Um, the first section is about the Greeks. And we start out with personal virtues. And then we talk about um, Krista Tippett, the book, Einstein's God. She has a website called On Being. So you can go www.onbeing.org. It's a public radio um, website. And she interviews people and she's got, I don't know, 15 years of, I think once a week or once a month, it's just tons, tons, hundreds of videos where she interviews all sorts of people. And every one of them, I think, unites reason and faith in some way. So if you wanted to do extra credit and go check it out, I'm going to show, I think I can excerpts, little clips from some of her interviews, but this, the first section of the class has four interviews about related to personal virtues. Um, so we have depression, stress, the biology of the spirit, and revenge. And so in all four of these, these are virtues and vices that every religion promotes or condemns. And then the interviewers unite, link that to um, social science, science, uh, psychology. So they're, they're uniting reason and faith in some way in relation to personal virtue, personal issues like depression, stress, revenge, and how to flourish, right? So that's the first section of the class. And, that, and then the next section is about political virtues, the virtue of citizenship. So we talk about Aristotle's virtues and I, you read some papers about how to apply Aristotle as a leader in a business leader or any sort of leadership position. And then global, uh, um, the United Nations, and being a leader in a country in the global society. And then, um, so that's the, oh yeah, and then we talk about humanism. There's secular humanism, religious humanism, spiritual humanism, Renaissance humanism, modern humanism, ancient humanism. Um, and the students find their own versions of humanism, African-American humanism, um, medicine and humanism, psychology and humanism. There's, they all find their own and they're all interesting. Then the next section of the class, we talk about humanist Confucian, humanist branches of Confucianism, humanism and Hinduism, humanism and Buddhism, humanism and Islam. So we focus on what they have in common as opposed to the news is always presenting what's different. And then the last week or the last couple day, I suppose in this class is um, the back to the union of reason and faith in the study of the cosmos, um, more cosmic 
uh, understandings like Einstein, his understanding of the universe and his understanding of God. And we have a quantum physicist and we have an, an atheist uh, mathematician. And so I just give you some other choices, right? Ideas about how people's minds work. So your mind is your idea of the ultimate good and of the human good and of your own good. And that's, that's what's on your mind. So I'm giving you an opportunity for you to get to know your own mind better and um, then to go off and decide that you're going to live the life of the mind. You're going to deliberately um, govern your life by your mind, and you're going to have a commitment to constantly re-examining your ideas about good and evil and justice and God, which just means that you're self-educating. You're educating your mind. And by doing so, you're becoming a good democratic citizen, a good citizen in a democracy. If you don't do that, we could, we could easily lose our democracy even more than we've already lost it. So um, we're heading in the wrong direction, but each generation has to pick up the torch and do its best. All right, I will see you tomorrow. It's 2 a.m. or something, yeah, I gotta go to bed.